My friend insisted upon my accompanying them in their expedition, which I was eager enough to do, for my curiosity and sympathy were deeply stirred by the story to which we had listened. I confess that the guilt of the banker's son appeared to me to be as obvious as it did to his unhappy father, but still I had such faith in Holmes's judgment that I felt that there must be some grounds for hope as long as he was dissatisfied with the accepted explanation. He hardly spoke a word the whole way out to the southern suburb, but sat with his chin upon his breast and his hat drawn over his eyes, sunk in the deepest thought. Our client appeared to have taken fresh heart at the little glimpse of hope which had been presented to him, and he even broke into desultory chat with me over his business affairs. A short railway journey and a shorter walk brought us to Fairbank, the modest residence of the great financier. Fairbank was a good-sized square house of white stone. Standing back a little from the road, a double carriage sweep with a snow-clad lawn stretched down in front to two large iron gates which closed the entrance. On the right side was a small wooden thicket which led into a narrow path between two neat hedges stretching from the road to the kitchen door and forming the tradesman's entrance. On the left ran a lane which led to the stables and was not itself within the grounds at all, being a public though little used thoroughfare. Holmes left us standing at the door and walked slowly all round the house, crossed the front, down the tradesman's path, and so round by the garden behind into the stable lane. So long was he that Mr. Holder and I went into the dining room and waited by the fire until he should return. We were sitting there in silence when the door opened and a young lady came in. She was rather above the middle height, slim, with dark hair and eyes which seemed the darker against the absolute pallor of her skin. I do not think that I have ever seen such deadly paleness in a woman's face. Her lips, too, were bloodless, but her eyes were flushed with crying as she swept silently into the room. She impressed me with a greater sense of grief than the banker had done in the morning, and it was the more striking in her, as she was evidently a woman of strong character, with immense capacity for self-restraint. Disregarding my presence, she went straight to her uncle and passed her hand over his head with a sweet, womanly caress. You have given orders that Arthur should be liberated, have you not, Dad? she asked. No, no, my girl, the matter must be probed to the bottom. But I am so sure that he is innocent. You know what woman's instincts are. I know that he has done no harm, and that you will be very sorry for having acted so harshly. Why is he silent, then, if he is innocent? Who knows? Perhaps because he was so angry that you should suspect him. How could I help suspecting him when I actually saw him with the coronet in his hand? Oh, but he had only picked it up to look at it. Oh, do, do take my word for it that he is innocent. Let the matter drop and say no more. It is so dreadful to think of our dear Arthur in prison. I shall never let it drop until the gems are found. Never, Mary. Your affection for Arthur blinds you as to the awful consequences to me. Far from hushing the thing up, I have brought a gentleman down from London to inquire more deeply into it. This gentleman? she asked, facing round to me. No, his friend. He wished us to leave him alone. He's round in the stable lane now. The stable lane? she raised her dark eyebrows. What can he hope to find there? Ah, this I suppose is he. I trust, sir, that you will succeed in proving what I feel sure is the truth, that my cousin Arthur is innocent of this crime. I fully share your opinion, and I trust with you that we may prove it, returned Holmes, going back to the mat to knock the snow from his shoes. I believe I have the honor of addressing Miss Mary Holder. May I ask you a question or two? Pray do, sir, if it may help to clear this horrible affair up. You heard nothing yourself last night? Nothing until my uncle here began to speak loudly. I heard that and I came down. You shut up the windows and doors the night before. Did you fasten all the windows? Yes. Were they all fastened this morning? Yes. You have a maid who has a sweetheart. I think that you remarked to your uncle last night that she had been out to see him. Yes, and she was the girl who waited in the drawing room and who may have heard uncle's remarks about the coronet. I see. You infer that she may have gone out to tell her sweetheart, and that the two may have planned the robbery. But what is the good of all these vague theories? cried the banker impatiently. When I have told you that I saw Arthur with a coronet in his hands. Wait a little, Mr. Holder. 
We must come back to that. About this girl, Miss Holder. You saw her return by the kitchen door, I presume? Yes, when I went to see if the door was fastened for the night, I met her slipping in. I saw the man, too, in the gloom. Do you know him? Oh, yes. He's the greengrocer who brings our vegetables round. His name is Francis Prosper. He stood, said Holmes, to the left of the door, that is to say, farther up the path than is necessary to reach the door? Yes, he did. And he is a man with a wooden leg? Something like fear sprang up in the young lady's expressive black eyes. Why, you are like a magician, said she. How do you know that? She smiled, but there was no answering smile in Holmes's thin, eager face. I shall be very glad now to go upstairs, said he. I shall probably wish to go over the outside of the house again. Perhaps I had better take a look at the lower windows before I go up. He walked swiftly round from one to the other, pausing only at the large one which looked down the hall onto the stable lane. This he opened and made a very careful examination of the sill with his powerful magnifying lens. Now we shall go upstairs, said he at last. The banker's dressing room was a plainly furnished little chamber with a grey carpet, a large bureau, and a long mirror. Holmes went to the bureau first and looked hard at the lock. Which key was used to open it? he asked. That which my son himself indicated, that of the cupboard of the lumber room. Have you it here? That is it on the dressing table. Sherlock Holmes took it up and opened the bureau. It is a noiseless lock, said he. It is no wonder that it did not wake you. This case, I presume, contains the coronet. We must have a look at it. He opened the case, and taking out the diadem, he laid it upon the table. It was a magnificent specimen of the jeweler's art, and the thirty-six stones were the finest that I have ever seen. At one side of the coronet was a cracked edge, where a corner holding three gems had been torn away. Now, Mr. Holder, said Holmes, here is the corner which corresponds to that which has been so unfortunately lost. Might I beg that you will break it off? The banker recoiled in horror. I should not dream of trying, said he. Then I will. Holmes suddenly bent his strength upon it, but without result. I feel it give a little, said he, but though I am exceptionally strong in the fingers, it would take me all my time to break it. An ordinary man could not do it. Now what do you think would happen if I did break it, Mr. Holder? There would be a noise like a pistol shot. Do you tell me that all this happened within a few yards of your bed, and that you heard nothing of it? I do not know what to think. It is all dark to me. But perhaps it may grow lighter as we go. What do you think, Miss Holder? I confess that I still share my uncle's perplexity. Your son had no shoes or slippers on when you saw him. He had nothing on save only his trousers and shirt. Thank you. We have certainly been favoured with extraordinary luck during this inquiry, and it will be entirely our own fault if we do not succeed in clearing the matter up. With your permission, Mr. Holder, I shall now continue my investigations outside. He went alone, at his own request, for he explained that any unnecessary footmarks might make his task more difficult. For an hour or more he was at work, returning at last with his feet heavy with snow and his features as inscrutable as ever. I think that I have seen now all that there is to see, Mr. Holder, said he. I can serve you best by returning to my rooms. But the gems, Mr. Holmes, where are they? I cannot tell. The banker wrung his hands. I shall never see them again, he cried. And my son, you give me hopes? My opinion is in no way altered. Then for God's sake, what was this dark business which was acted in my house last night? If you can call upon me at my Baker Street rooms tomorrow morning, between nine and ten, I shall be happy to do what I can to make it clearer. I understand that you give me carte blanche to act for you, provided only that I get back the gems, and that you place no limit on the sum I may draw. I would give my fortune to have them back. Very good. I shall look into the matter between this and then. Goodbye. It is just possible that I may have to come over here again before evening. It was obvious to me that my companion's mind was now made up about the case, although what his conclusions were was more than I could even dimly imagine. Several times during our homeward journey I endeavoured to sound him upon the point, but he always glided away to some other topic until at last I gave it over in despair. 
It was not yet three when we found ourselves in our rooms once more. He hurried to his chamber and was down again in a few minutes, dressed as a common loafer. With his collar turned up, his shiny, seedy coat, his red cravat, and his worn boots, he was a perfect sample of the class. I think this should do, said he, glancing into the glass above the fireplace. I only wish that you could come with me, Watson, but I fear that it won't do. I may be on the trail in this matter, or I may be following a will-o'-the-wisp, but I shall soon know which it is. I hope that I may be back in a few hours. He cut a slice of beef from the joint upon the sideboard, sandwiched it between two rounds of bread, and thrusting this rude meal into his pocket, he started off upon his expedition.